25 Faux Time Amateur Radio Podcast W4NTO Dayton Updates and more Stay tuned AmateurRadio15.com presents Faux Time The Other Ham Radio Podcast Sponsored by Main Trading Company Find them online at MTCRadio.com now, here's your host, Kale Nelson, K4CDN. Hey, yeah, welcome in to episode number 25. I am Kale, your host, Kilo for Charlie Delta November. Thank you so much for being a part of the Photime Amateur Radio Podcast. It's a lot of fun. We do it every other week right here. You can find us online. It's photime.com. The original URL still in existence is amateurradio15.com. You can check us out there, Amateur Radio 15. And I got to mention, I got to tell you, my great friends at Main Trading Company have come through again. I came home from vacation, if you want to call it that, the other day, and I had a had an order that I had received from them, and it was here in a matter of days. I mean, so fast, so quick. The prices were great. I bought me a new vertical for UHF and VHF, along with one of the tripods that they're selling, 29 bucks, heavy-duty tripod, to use with my, with my brand-new Pack Tenna antenna kit which I hope to have up by this weekend doing some testing out here on the farm. So check them out. Your friends, my friends, Richard and Christy Lenore. You'll find them at mtcradio.com. Some great friends to have in the hobby if you're needing some new, used, pre-owned gear, warranty programs, financing. They've got it all. mtcradio.com. Now, before we get into the Fritz show, of course, we got a giveaway, but I'm going to make you wait to the end, okay? Plus... Plus, we're going to talk with Jeremy real quick about what's happening at Dayton with him and our friends from the show. Back in just a sec. All right, so we've got Jeremy on here with us. Uh, Jeremy, KF7IJZ. You can find him on YouTube. His channel is KF7IJZ. The funny part about that is is that I only use Z when I'm talking about Jeremy's call, and Jeremy kind of just shamed me into that back when we first got to know each other here on the podcast. So, Jeremy, welcome back in. It's been about three episodes since we've had you on the show. Uh, you're going to Dayton, and I want to talk about you going to Dayton because I can't make it. Yes, I am, and it's uh, good to be back. And sorry about the Zed thing, but again, it's so people don't think my call sign is IJ Charlie. Yeah, because those Charlies are no good. No, they're no. they're really not. Charlie Delta November. That's okay. No, no comment. <laughs> so you, you're going to Dayton, and uh, you're you're going to be there repping your your YouTube channel. You're going to be there repping the Full Time Amateur Radio podcast, and you've got some things lined up. Tell us a little bit about – well, let me ask you this. This is not the first time you've gone. Matter of fact, you've gone over and over and over and over, and I read somewhere on, online the other day, one of our friends online said they've gone for like the last 37 years or something ridiculous. Why do people keep going back to Dayton? What is the reason for someone to go to Dayton? Uh, well, the, the reason you go the first time is because it's, as someone in my old club used to say, it's, it's ham radio Mecca. Um, my favorite thing personally is the fact that pretty much every vendor in the industry is there, both the retailers and the manufacturers. Um, and I've gotten to have some really awesome, honest conversations and get a little bit of insight about new products. Um, I've been able to talk to companies to say, Hey, you know, I really don't like the fact your product does X, Y, Z. Why is that? And sometimes they'll take the feedback and improve it. Um, another reason to go is just like, you know, for those who don't know, I recently moved from Washington, D.C. to uh, the Cincinnati, Ohio area, and I'm really looking forward to seeing my old club. Uh, they have a big contingent that goes every year. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, there's, like ham radio, there's something at Dayton for everybody. Even showers and jazzies. <laughs> there are a lot of jazzies. I don't know about the showers. I think maybe it'd be better if there were more showers. <laughs> But definitely lots of jazzies and lots of hotels with showers. Okay. Well, and, and if you don't have a hotel room, you probably won't get one really close right now. But don't don't not go for that reason. There are places to stay. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you're anywhere, if you're on the West Coast and you can go, go. We've got some friends that will be there from the West Coast. And we have some friends that will be there from the heart of Texas as well. Yep, that's right. I, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Main Trading Company, our sponsors, and finally getting to meet uh, Richard and Christy in person. 
Um, and actually, Avi will be dropping off a box of cards that they'll be handing out for us to help uh, advertise a show for the hands who haven't seen us. Uh, and then I will actually be spending a fair amount of time um, around our friends Nick and George of Pignology and Sierra Radio Systems fame independently. Uh, they have a couple of booths together in the, uh, the ball arena, I believe. And uh, they've offered to let me use that as kind of a base of operations. And they'll be there... Um, you know, showing off the technology products, showing off the Sierra Radio uh, Systems products, but most of all, they'll be showing off the new Pac Tenna system. Um, I'll actually be there wandering around with a microphone and a recorder, trying to interview folks from different radio companies or different product companies of. Uh, that we know our listeners are interested in. So I would say if you have somebody you want me to talk to or some information you'd like me to find out to bring back to the podcast, uh, feel free to leave a comment, email Kale, or you can email me at kf7ijz at gmail.com. That's easy enough. Now, if you can remember all that, you're good. But here's the deal. Jeremy's going. He'd love to meet you. And if you've got some stuff you'd like for him to dig around in, like you said, send him an email, kf7ijz at gmail.com. Jeremy, I hope you guys have a great time. I got my Pactena in the mail just earlier this week and uh, hope to get it set up next weekend. I'm going to be out of town for just a couple of days, but hope to get that up. It's, it looks really cool, guys. I, I'm really excited about it. So make sure you make plans now to be there in Dayton, Ohio. Anything? Can you tell folks, Jeremy, real quick before we go, is there anything that you can share with us for someone who's never been, but you, you try to prepare them in any way that they may not be prepared for? Bring comfortable shoes. Um and be prepared for different elements of the weather. I I remember even the first time I went, which my first time as I think four years ago, um, there was nothing that could prepare me. And uh, actually the funny thing is, so I've I've gone the last three, four years, I've actually never spent any real time in the flea market. I've always spent all of my time in the commercial vendor halls, like inside the arena. So um you know, come wear comfortable shoes, bring a big wallet and uh, a bag to carry your stuff around if you buy. Um, but you're going to, everybody's going to find something there. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I hope you guys have a great time. Thanks to all the folks who have been here with us on the program throughout <clears throat> these uh, first 25 episodes. And make sure, make sure you find Jeremy. Go by the MTC table, I think, there at North Hall 208, and they will have our cards there as well. Uh, it's it's almost like a mini QSO card. They look pretty nice too, don't you think, Jeremy? Yeah, I was I was pretty happy. And I actually have to say one more thing I forgot okay. is um, Nick of Pignology and 3WG, as he has done the last two years at Dayton, uh, will be giving a talk on Friday morning uh, at 1030. And it will either be on uh, the latest generation of mobile rig control, uh, Internet of Things type stuff, uh, or it may actually be on the design of their new portable um antenna analyzer that they've been working on. I, I spoke with him a little while ago and uh, he's got two presentations ready and he's going to uh, poll the audience to see which one they would prefer. God, I love um, smart people. <laughs> I, you know, the, the secret to success is surrounding yourself with people smarter than yourself. Dude, I have got that nailed. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, thanks, man. Hey, you guys make sure you find Jeremy at Dayton and he's going to try to get some stuff and we're going to try to get it back on the air as quick as we can. So there may be some special uh, special event episodes coming your way at, uh, in and around the Dayton time. So, of course, you can keep up with us at itsfotime.com. Jeremy, have fun, man. Thank you so much for being here with us again, and we'll catch you on the other side of Dayton. All right, thanks, Kale. Hopefully you'll be able to join us soon. That'd be great. So he was one of the very first persons I met on my initial testing session a few years back. Also one of the very first QSOs I had on the local two-meter repeater. His name is Fritz Nitsch. W4 NTO. He says W4, no time to operate. I say W4, never too old. Anyway, he's a great guy. He are, he's a hardworking dude. He was climbing up till he's about 83, 84 years old, and he still gets on his tower some as long as none of us know about it. Fritz invited me to his home right after the first of the year, and that's when we taped this interview. Now, I got to tell you, we recorded it in Fritz's kitchen. I probably could have come up with a better idea had I really thought about how great my micro recorder really is. There are times during the program here that you're going to hear the refrigerator running. Other times, you'll hear some water dripping in the sink. We need to work on that too, Fritz, by the way, to keep your water bill down. For, on occasion, you may hear a thud or a thump sound. 
in the recording, and that was where Fritz was not operating a straight key, but I think somewhere inside his mind, he had his hand on a key, and he was tapping the table, I guess, just out of habit. Had a lot of fun chatting with Fritz, and I believe you'll enjoy this program. If this is your first time with us, if you're here just to hear Fritz, welcome in. We have a lot of fun. This program is geared toward a new amateur or someone kind of looking to get into the hobby, but if you've been around a while, I want to welcome you in. Again, my name is Kale. My call is Kilo for Charlie Delta November, and I'm going to dump us right into this conversation as Fritz is interviewing me. years old and my granddad gave me an old Johnson 23 channel CB yeah and I had paid attention enough to know that red was positive black was negative right and I I didn't have a we didn't have a power supply or anything laying around so one evening my dad came in the house he said son did you take the battery out of my lawnmower I said yes sir I had taken the battery out of the lawnmower, and I was powering the Johnson, (laughs) and I was talking to the truckers at 85 at the TA. (laughs) And I I learned about amateur radio when I worked at Radio Shack in the late 80s, early 90s. You were working the counter radio? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Had guys come in all the time, and they would always encourage me to get my license. But the, the code scared me off, and I was chasing girls and... Big yeah, stereos, yeah. you know, speakers and stuff. But the, the code is the uh, uh, what do we call it? The the minimum requirement because that means that you're interested enough to to cram. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm surprised that they did away with it. But uh, what the heck? Yeah. Well, now it's something I desperately want to learn. So. <laughs> well, that's I I found that out. There's a guy that. Uh, well, the old fogies, uh, KK4BIK. Yeah. He says, "Hey, I got, I got a book about the uh, uh, code uh, lessons, mm. and uh, he's uh, bragging about getting into it." Yeah. yeah. So I'm hoping to learn it. Actually, I actually want to learn it with my kids. Their minds are ripe. They'll soak it up like yeah. a sponge. Yeah. And, well, Dad, why do we need to know that? I said, imagine being able to speak a language nobody else can, except a very select few. Right, and that kind of gets their minds working. So I'm, I, yeah, yeah, I'm hoping to start soon. Do you do you play an uh, an instrument? I did. I played tenor saxophone. You're in like Flint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my job teaching. Is it rhythm? Yeah. Is that what you learned? Yeah. Wow. The uh, out at Camp Croft here, the uh, I was there for uh, thirty five months. Mm. And uh, they had a procedure to uh, teach code, and uh, it would tell them whether whether they could learn the code or not. A a, a given number of, well, they had a, a pair of groups. They'd send a whole bunch of letters scrambled, but one group would leave a dot out or add a dash at the end. Then you had to uh, decide whether are they are they the same or are, is something different. Mm-hmm. We threw it out. We were in the business of of uh, making radio operators, and this took too long. Mm. So we uh, we come up with uh, five letters: F, G, R, M, U. I remember those. <laughs> if they can learn those in an hour, we grabbed them. Wow! And yeah, the musicians, we grabbed them because they they soaked it up like a sponge, and. Uh, 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 Frank Bruno was one of them. He, uh, he he played a concertina. You know what a concertina is? That's a. It, it's got a million buttons on one yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. And he he could finger that thing just like, like he was made for it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and we and and we grabbed uh, and he became a sergeant real quick. He had a platoon out here, and uh, I had a platoon, but uh, I was no more a soldier than. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the closest thing to a survey in the army ever had. <laughs> yeah, if I lost a button, I put a safety pin in. They just shook their head. Oh my! And now this was this was fatigue. Now, yeah, I did have all the buttons on you anymore. On your dress. On the dress, yeah. So tell me, tell me, Fritz, how did you get into radio? I mean, how far did did radio go? Radio go back for you? Crystal sets. 
Okay. Uh, my daddy was responsible. Uh, he had the uh, popular mechanics, and uh, they had a radio section, uh, a page or two in that, uh, the voice radio. And uh, it had a uh, pancake coil. Uh, this is a uh, circular thing with splines cut out of the cardboard, uh, odd number, so that when you interleaved it uh, and it went in a circle, by, uh, you had uh, a little space between, uh, it, was, it was a pancake coil, as a term for it, mm -hmm. and it was flat. You had a crystal thing on the middle, you fiddle with that to find a sensitive spot. Uh, now you buy crystals that are already sealed up, you don't have to deal with a, with a cat whisker and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, that worked. For, this was up in Rochester, New York. We had two broadcasts: WHEC and WHAM. Only forty kc apart. <laughs> so you heard both of both of them. Yeah. One of them had a lot more power, so it it uh, that was a predominant thing when you get out in his frequency. You had the little slider that you moved around to get the number of turns to get it resonant. You didn't have a tuner to condense it. So uh, that bothered me on why you couldn't separate the, the two signals. So uh, uh, I, I read some other things and they talked about coupling two coils together and uh, putting the crystal tapped halfway down on one coil so it didn't load the coil up. So the, so the coil became very selective. And he had a, a tuning condenser like, like that, except a little bit smaller. He had two of them, matter of fact. One, one of the coils had that condenser in series with the antenna, and the other, the other one uh, was just internal with the crystal. So you'd, you'd bring the coils closer together until you watched the meter, and it, the meter didn't come up anymore. And you knew you were at optimum coupling. And then you could adjust each of them for that particular band, for that particular... You had two knobs to change, but at least you could separate the two stations. Mm. So, uh, so, so what uh, were you, you just wanted to listen to the radio just for the entertainment purposes of it? and Not really. Uh, uh, they had, uh, WHAM had the more music, mm. but uh, no, I was more interested in how come I couldn't hear one or the other. Uh, instead right. of having and to put up a bow. <laughs> and, and this article emphasized that. So he right. said, well, that's, that's exactly what I need is to uh, be able to separate these two. So it was your dad and his popular he mechanics. Started, he started with a, with a pancake coil. Right. And I had to wind the coil around and around and I had to scrape the, uh, scrape the cotton covering on the wire so that you could make contact with a little thing to change the inductance. Right, I got you. <laughs> but it was brought as a barn door. How old were you? I was probably uh, 10 or 12 years old in that area, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of, that kind of, kind of got you in, that was it for you, that's what kind of kicked that, you in the radio, that's, electronics? That's, that was the beginning of the end. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any idea that you'd be where you are today? Not it, 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 I had. Uh, uh, I mean, you're just a kid. I just a kid, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I didn't, I didn't have much schooling. I, I uh, the, uh, they have a caste system in the fatherland. Uh, if your, if your father went to uh, high school, you were limited to going to high school. If your father had a real education. Yeah, you were expected to go uh, take college. Mm. Uh, so apparently my father uh, never never uh, stumbled beyond the high school and that was all they expected of me. Right. And I didn't have any any uh, ambition myself. <laughs> I was trying to get away from school. Yeah, yeah. What 11, 12 year old boy is it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, after you got that kind of taken tackled, taken care of, what was your next project? Or did you just kind of stay there for a little bit? Uh, well, I got out of school 
and then I was expected to earn some money. Mm. That was that was uh, spelled out. I mean, it, it was obvious, you know. So right. I uh, I worked as a plumber's helper, and uh, and I worked in uh, a uh, radio wholesale place as a, as a clerk. Uh, what was the name of that? Uh, okay, was it? Uh, anyways, in Rochester, and then uh, uh, it didn't pay anything, so uh, I uh, went with. Uh, well, let's see. I stayed someplace uh, for nine years. I think it was at the radio station as a as a so-called engineer. Okay. But all they had to do was. Keep track of program. Hmm. Uh, make sure, make sure it was on the on the list. Make sure that the tapes were available, and uh, or if I had to record something at a certain time, and, yeah. Uh, that's that's what took about nine years. Then Uncle, but it's in pain. Then Uncle Sam called you. Uh, no. No. I went with uh, CAA and FAA. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to get my. Let's see. I I think I was with CAA when they drafted me. Uh, I'll lose track of the sequence. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got drafted, uh, and uh, three days later I was down here in South Carolina. I I knew code by that time. Right. So they grabbed me and uh, and kept me here uh, almost three years. Now, why did you learn code? Just for your own sake, or was it a Boy Scout thing, or? Uh, I was intended to get an amateur license. Okay. I forget who, who I knew up there that was a ham, uh, up in Rochester. And it may have been somebody at, at uh, when I was at the counter. Mm. But anyway, uh, the, uh, what was I going to lead up to? Well, Either I went with CIA after I was drafted. I was only in the army about four and a half years. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and three years of that was right down here in Camp Crow. And then, they, then they had enough radio operators and they ran me into Europe. So. <laughs> they, they got all of you they could get, huh? They put me in the headquarters company. I never fired no weapon. <laughs> Tell me about Croft. Um, now it's just a big campground and a big state right. facility, but back then it was a pretty serious training facility for the for the war effort. Well, there was Camp Croft came here because we had Camp Wadsworth here in the first war. And that was at, on the west side of town, right? I think it was, okay. yeah. I, I never went around that okay. way. But, uh, yeah, Wadsworth. I had an uncle that was at Wadsworth, and he came back. Mm -hmm. uh, Uncle John. But uh, they they found out that uh, the area was uh, kind to the GIs. Ah, uh, okay. Southern hospitality? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. I got you. It, it was that way in the first war. So in the second war, when they, uh, they, they built this, I think we were on the south side of town, weren't we? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's what the wife found me, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was it like coming out of Rochester and winding up in the Deep South? Was that quite a stretch for you? This was like heaven. <laughs> Rochester is snowed in about nine months out of the year. Oh, my goodness. Not that bad. Yeah, but, but uh, it's cold. It's a lot I, colder. Yeah, and uh, I was born in Syracuse, and they tell me that, that they had four feet of snow in one night. Wow. And uh, my daddy, I don't remember that, but my daddy says, yeah, we couldn't open the front door. We put a rope around you and let you off the porch roof <laughs> with a big shovel. So he, he says, you get down on that. The wind had blown it off the, the roof, but it was drifted up against the front door. So uh, I had that shovel, and he said, you get down on the edge there, and you make a hole with that shovel as you go down. And... Uh, uh, that's what I did. I worked my way around, and uh, they had a hole in the rope. Yeah, know. yeah. I guess my mother had it too. But anyway, they uh, 
uh, I finally worked my way down to the to the door uh, under the porch itself, and and we got the door open. You never had that problem in South Carolina. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine what it was like. I was only four or five when when that happened. Yeah. Honey. And uh, here I came down here, and it's another world. Did Did you come down on the train? Yeah. They, yeah. They put you in a Pullman yeah. car, or uh, I don't. I don't no, remember. I think I think they just passed sandwiches around as, I got you. as we came down. Yeah, but uh, what um, what did when, when you got when you got here? Did they immediately or did did they qualify you or did, how did they determine that you were a future radio operator? Oh, in the army? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they they interviewed me up in Rochester. Okay, and, and uh, uh, they. they Tried to find out what they were getting. See, we were probably uh, bare ass naked and uh, and uh, whatever you know. Right. Uh, and uh, they uh, apparently they learned something that they really needed uh, because uh, when I got down here, uh, yeah, we had. Uh, uh, I remember Sergeant Hensley. He was uh, he was a uh, Staff sergeant, and uh, uh, they had me doing close order drill and all the other garbage. And one time I was out there in a formation, and Hensley says, "Hey, drop that. We're going to put a code room together." <laughs> yeah. So they had a rec hall, and they made it into a code room. It had a big room, mm -hmm. and uh, it had uh, uh, eighteen or twenty tables in it. Each of them had 10 positions. No, each of them had 20 positions. Wow. They could handle, they could handle uh, 20 times uh, the number of tables, uh, at least 10 tables in that room. So two, uh, a minimum of 200 operators. Yeah, yeah. Or trainees. Yeah, yeah no, it wasn't full all the time. Right, yeah. But uh, it would handle uh, a couple of companies for it. Yeah. Uh, and we had to, give these tests to see if they're fit to learn to code. So we had a lot of people coming in that were uh, not part of our company. Mm -hmm. We took them from each of the battalions around Camp Crow, marched them over, sat them down with earphones, and, uh, and uh, fed them the prescribed thing, uh, the thing that we threw out and, and made them learn, or give them five letters at a time. One one letter, letter repeated four or five times, and uh, we'd look and see if they were writing, and then we uh, they'd repeat the next letter four or five times. But it's a total of five letters that they would uh, master, mm. and uh, they, uh, like I say, the ones that soaked it up were musicians primarily. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Apolovich was was another one, and they made a sergeant out of him real quick, too. <laughs> so you, you get the guys in, you figure out who's who's competent, who's who can do the, the job who could, there. Who can do it in the shortest time. Mm -hmm. Now, their, their particular test they had would say uh, whether they could learn. But uh, that, that we didn't have much time for that. So what did you guys, once you determined that the person could learn the code, where did they go from there? Uh, they were shipped out. This was a, uh, a uh, what they call it, infantry replacement center, IRC. Mm. So they, they would, uh, they, they, uh, they'd just be assigned. They didn't have any choice. Right. They'd, they'd run them out to a, to a, a regiment or a division that, that need a radio operator. Mm -hmm. They were preparing for whatever, any kind of a movement. Right. Did, did, did you do any sort of training uh, beyond just determining who needed the code or who could do the code? We, 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 gave, we gave them, once we found out they were capable, then we, uh, we, we gave them the, the next lessons. It got them out of five words a minute uh, to uh, seven or eight, and then we have another one for ten words a minute. And we had people that would soak it up at 25 words a minute, just quick fire. Wow. 
uh, I remember Bruno. He was a rough Brooklynite, but uh, he he made sergeant. Yeah, right <laughs> <Quite> quick. <laughs> he was good with his hands. Well, yeah, and he was he was good for showing authority too. Mm. And uh, and he could carry it out. Now I had a couple of the good corporals that did all that for me. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I was the smallest guy. In yeah. The yeah. Well, um, so you, you spent three years at Camp Crofts? 35 months. 35 months. Yeah. And this yeah. is where you met your wife? She found me. Yeah. She found you. Yeah. She was a Spartanburg native? Yeah. Yeah, she was the first grade school teacher. Wow. And, uh, uh, good looking, yeah. But I found out she had quite a few years over me, too. <laughs> she finally admitted about 10 years more than I had. And somebody told me, hey, she's just being kind to you. <laughs> <laughs> so did, did you get married before you left? Yeah. You did? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I got married about, uh, I'd been down here two Yeah, it, it's about a year before I left. Okay. Okay. And we had an apartment, the uh, Bell Hill Apartments, as a matter of fact. Okay. I know where Bell Hill is. It's right there where Carlos right Business on, is. Right on Main. Yeah. 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 So you went, where did you go when you left Croft? I went into Europe. Okay. Well, I went into England, and then I went across. Uh, I was in the uh, Second Armor Division. Okay. And uh, I was there about, uh, about a year and a half total. Got into Berlin. That was the, the best service I ever had. Really? They were living on potato soup. Oh my. And fertilizing it at night. They're growing their own potatoes. Really? Yeah. Boy, they welcomed us with open arms. Mm. And uh, the, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, Ernest Kratz was a sculptor. And uh, we moved into his house, and he he moved back to the uh, to the garage behind a big garage, two three or four car garage. Wow! And uh, he only had one student, but anyway, uh, that's what they were, they were living on potato soup in Berlin. Wow! And of course, he uh, he took me around and showed me the stuff that he had uh, done on the bridge abutments and sculpturing the stuff that was there and it was laying in the water where where they bound it. Hmm. And, uh, uh, so uh, I'd I'd go to the to the mess tent and uh, and uh, get my rations and then uh, go back for more and go back for more. I I'd make three trips back and they knew what we were up to. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah we're sharing. Sharing is the word. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I was feeding him, and and he had one one student, a good looking yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, August Krantz, I remember him. He was he was quite a character. But they uh, they uh, instead of instead of an enemy coming into their city, why they welcomed us with open arms. Wow. So, uh, how long did you stay there? Overseas, uh, it was uh, a little over a year, I think. Yeah. Okay. I had three years here, and I had a total of four. Yeah, no, about a year and a half. Okay, about a year and a half. A little while in England, and then then we went over, and then we became occupation. By that time, the war was over. Right. In fact, it was it was over with when when we got in there. Say, wow. uh, well, our outfit. Was a was a fighting outfit, the Second Armor Division. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a demonstration division, really, the first and the second. If they want a formation of military strength, they use those things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I never served, well, but that it, we had a, we had infantry attached to us. Okay, uh, they were part of uh, of another division, probably, but we had infantry. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember one time uh, we were going down the down the road, and uh, they ran into some interference up there. So they ran the infantry in to clean it out. Apparently, uh, apparently it was not another armored outfit they came up again. It was infantry. Mm. So we ran our uh, regiment of infantry in, 
and uh, uh, they cleaned. We were coiled up in the field, I remember. And uh, I remember a plane going over, and uh, somebody says, "Hey, that ain't one of ours. That's that's a crow." So uh, everybody started banging away with their handguns. We had air, anti-aircraft. You know how loud 50 caliber is? Mm. Uh, four of them branched <laughs> on the back of a, of a small vehicle. <laughs> well, we were, we were 100 feet away and we could hardly talk to each other. Wow. They were banging away and the brass was spewing out of that thing. And uh, I took my earphones off and I started banging. Well, we had a, we had a 50 caliber on a half track. So I, nobody was bothering it, so I climbed up there and, uh, and started banging away. I never fired it, but I knew it had a big lever to pull back. And uh, there was something came in the chamber and, right. and uh, it started banging away. Yeah. It wasn't <laughs> full, it was semi auto so right. instead of what they had. So I, I banged it a few times, and, uh, and uh, by that time the, the plane went off in the horizon. When it got all through, I had shot my own antenna off. <laughs> well, I've never heard the end of that. I bet you didn't. <laughs> well, I was swinging. When, when you when you uh, stop a uh, vehicle and you got radio, you 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 uh, put the whip up because mm. they had a lot of street cars there, overhead power line. Okay. You'd, you'd get nicked. Mm. So uh, we we had let the thing up just by habit and. Uh, Sure enough, about three feet up, I chopped it. <laughs> it changed resonance real quick, huh? <laughs> well, it's one of those kind that's screwed together, about three feet long. Okay. Uh, and it went up four or five sections. Wow. So all I had to do was replace the, the, the bottom and the next to the bottom section. Yeah. That's pretty good. I didn't, I've never heard that one, Fritz. I like that. <laughs> well, I'm not too proud of it. Was that, was that, the, uh, was that the extent of your... You're uh, firing in the war. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only time. If you're gonna only do it once. You might as well do it with a 50 cal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, wow. that's quite a shell, you know. It's about oh, that. Yeah. It, it, at least that long. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess it's I, better. I you're... told that to a few people. Yeah, there, that's a good one. They just shake their head. Yeah. Well, that's a. I appreciate you sharing it with us. Um. All right. So you spent you spent four years in Uncle Sam's army. Yeah, a little over. A little four over four years. years. You yeah. came back home. Yeah. Um, where'd you go then? I got into the filmmaking area, not the camera part of it. Mm -hmm. That's right. My father was with Graphlex, but I went into the uh, the film business with uh, I forget whether Graphlex was into the film or whether it was uh, Kodak, uh, but. Uh, Anyway, I went into the filmmaking area, and my job was electronics by that time. And uh, they had a uh, a method of putting material on the raw stock uh, to uh, take the picture out. The film is about five feet wide uh, when they make it, and, yeah. and then you split it to whatever thirty-five millimeter or whatever uh, you have. Mm -hmm. Were you an amateur? How long after you finished World War your service in World War Two, did you get your amateur license? I got it in forty six. Okay, I remember that. <laughs> uh, I forget which month. I may have the, the license, but I was a W two. Okay. W two QXJ. That's a mouthful. That's that's <laughs> everybody's impression. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, was I glad when I came down here. Because you couldn't bring your license with you then, right? If when you left, that's right. You had you had to yeah, reassign. You had to, you had to get a W W four down there. How many calls have you had in the four, or since, you, or has it been always been W four NTO? It's always W W four. Yeah. Oh, there's an N four uh, NTO, you know. Right. Uh, he felt in fellow's name is his first name is Trip. Every time he checks in, he has N four NTO high high. <laughs> They know my no right. Yeah, yeah. They they're like, hey, that's Fritz. No, it's not. It's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He checks in uh, when I check in. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, he 
But he doesn't do it regularly. He does it when he has time. Right. So that was 1946 that you were licensed. Right. And then I was, I was uh, up there a couple of years and uh, I came down here. I think, let me, let me get it straight here now. I came down here in 41. Yeah, that's right. The wife was from here. That's why we came down. Okay. Yeah. She was the first grade school teacher and she didn't like the snow. And by that time, I didn't like it. <laughs> so uh, she got she got a, a job at Carlisle and uh, and uh, what did I end up doing down here? Oh, I went with WSPA. Okay, the local television yeah. and radio. Yeah, radio. Radio okay. itself. Not, right. not, not the television. Okay. And uh, I stayed there about nine years. And some and somebody says, "Why don't you get out of that and make some money?" <laughs> and I did. And and the CAA didn't pay a heck of a lot, but it was about three times more than what I was making. Wow. Uh, and uh, the uh, they changed the name from CAA to FAA. They just they keep airplanes from banging into each other. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, they also had towers. Uh, they had five towers uh, over the local airport here. And uh, I, there was a microwave tower on uh, 85 and 26, was it? And there was another one out there at, uh, there, was, there was two, one of them was 200 and some odd feet and the other one was about 100 feet. And uh, I was at the at the local airport down here, and uh, I remember Ed Harris, an ex-marine. He's a good man, very gruff, but uh, he says, "Would you screw the bulbs in in that tower over there? Otherwise, we have to route the airplane through." So I ran up the tower and came down, and. Uh, screwed the bulbs in so they could land look uh, they could use the local airport mm. they ran me out to school uh, at uh, Oak City for uh, something for the equipment they had and uh, when I came back they had written in that that was part of my job description climbing tower <laughs> <laughs> up to 400 feet they right. had a I found out they had a tower down there on the coast, 400 feet, a non-directional beacon. So I said, no, I'm not going to. Uh, I had gone up 100 feet. I said, no, I'll let them figure out how they get. He gets somebody out of Atlanta that it's their business climbing. Mm. I mean, they're built like tree trunks, you know. <laughs> and uh, But they'd have to pay them per diem, and, and it would cost a little bit to screw some bulbs in. So, yeah. so I said, so. Let them do it. I, 400 feet sound awful to me. Mm. So uh, anyway, that was that was part of the job when bulbs went out. But the the microwave towers, you climb up inside. Completely different feeling than hanging on the outside. Mm. So uh, they uh, that one, the tallest one was 200 and something, and uh, and uh, that was no issue. You have, you know what a buoy light is? It's a light that, that's on a float out, out in the water that, okay. that, that usually uh, beeps a signal to warn the ship to get a, keep away from that shallow place. Mm -hmm. uh, it had one bulb above the other, and it had this, uh, they were 600 and some odd watch, you couldn't touch those things. Wow. But it, it had one above the other, and you you list the uh, the uh, red covering over it, the marker off with a hinge, and then you could get the bulb on top always blew uh, burned out, and you could tell which is lit from the ground. So uh, it, you if you see one of them go out, why well, you replace both of them? I got you. And I carried three of them in case I dropped one. So, I yeah. mean, we're talking a bulb like that. 
six hundred watts. Like the size of a cantaloupe. Just about like that. They had a little bit. They had a they had a bigger base. Yeah. And uh, so uh, you take a bulb out. Well, if you still had one lit, you had to cut the power down there so that you could change it. You change the top one anyway, because that always burns out from the added heat. What were you doing besides changing light bulbs for WSPA radio after the war? Were you just a, like a, a general tech for them? Uh, no, with, with WSPA, I worked. I worked the studios as an engineer running tape okay. and that stuff. Okay. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, uh, that was. Uh, it was an indoor job. It, it, uh, but it didn't involve it, it didn't involve uh, lights at SPA. The, the bulbs happened when I was with FAA. Uh, FAA. Okay, I got CAA, you. Yeah. yeah. Um, where were you at in your amateur amateur days when you were working? Started working with the F CAA to the FAA. Were you um, still just uh, your primary interest was was CW and? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Because that's still really. I had I had a long exposure to it, so yeah. I didn't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> My vocabulary is not good enough for phone. Do you remember when um, when phone really kind of called on, and people were going from from AM to single sideband? Uh, not really. Yeah. Not really. Yeah. It happened in a, in another world, really. Yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, see, I, I built I built my own transmitters. As a matter of fact, I mean the, that the facet of it. Yeah. But I have stuff that that are already built too. Every morning I use the homebrew jump. Mm. Uh, the homebrew jump that works probably is as good as anything I could purchase today. It's got twice the power of most of the exciters. Most of the exciters are in the 100 watt area. This one has two on. Uh -huh. I, uh, I use, put three tubes in parallel, and I, on the 6146, for instance, I run about 800 volts on them. Wait, they're rated for, for uh, 750. I think that's the maximum, and I, I exceed the maximum by, by at least 50 volts. Right. But uh, it's, it's CW and it's only exposed to that much uh, about half of the time. So the, right. The, the spaces between the letters and, and so on. Um, and I blow air on. <laughs> A lot of air. <laughs> Some of it's hot air yeah, when I yeah. get on phone too. Wow. Um, tell me a little bit about being here in town and uh, people wanting to learn amateur radio, people wanting to learn about how to learn the code. For instance, Keith and Larry, um, two guys here that, that uh, they, they see you more, more as a, a father figure than an Elmer because you've been such a part of their life for so long. Um, that, that's right. Both of them got their license at the same time. Yeah. Keith was... W uh, four LPX and Larry was uh, uh, LPV, little puny farmer. Uh, <laughs> so Keith Keith got the XP, right. but anyway, uh, that, uh, and that at that time you didn't have to have three people uh, to uh, administer. Just, just one. That was all that was necessary. And then they found out there was, there was some collusion about it, and uh, uh, somebody paying off for the license and that. And they, right. they decided to have three people for it. So, in, in addition to your work with the CAA, FAA, you also were an Elmer to folks here. To a certain uh, extent. To a certain yeah, extent. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and you taught CW to people. Did you teach it? Yeah. In your home, or did you teach it at a, a school? I, I, taught, I taught it at home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The wife put up with an awful lot. So, <laughs> so this is where this is where the maybe the term door knocking comes from. Somebody 
sees or knows that you're an amateur mm-hmm. and they decide they want to become an amateur so they I come to you? I've never heard the term a Really? Yeah, yeah. I just stumbled over it not uh, too so long ago. We've always had the club. Right. And and the word of mouth got, got out that uh, uh, where we met and that and they would come to the club. Tell and, me, tell uh, me about the club because you were, you were one of the, uh, you were one of the founding charter members of the club. Yeah, yeah. What year? Do you remember what year that was? You found it? Uh, no, I can't. Uh, it's in the fifties. They, I know they, they had to move around a lot of different places yeah. before they finally got to the Harrow. Right. Uh, and a lot of the fellas. Uh, know the areas better than I do on, yeah. on where we and where we met. Right. We've met in basements and and so on. But, uh, it's a that was a long time ago. Yeah. So the hobby's been good to you? Uh yeah, I guess so, yeah. Yeah. You served you served as a an official observer for how many years? Gee, I don't know. Fifteen, twenty years maybe. Now the folks listening to the to the show probably don't really know what an OO does. You want to tell us real quick? We try to get to them before the government gets to them. <laughs> In other words, if we hear a, a lousy signal, uh, we send a card out. Uh, a lot of mine were just plain turkey signals, where they uh, had a homebrew pile or key in an oscillator or something like that. And uh, the signal would be what we classify as, as a lousy signal, a chirping signal. And uh, I've, I've got a box of replies in the other room, a box about that long and, and that wide with replies I've gotten over the years. Uh, when I send a card, I just tell them what I heard. I don't preach. Right. Uh, and, uh, they, uh, I haven't got any uh, any derogatory replies. As a matter of fact. Wow! And that was a, a volunteer position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nothing paid. The ARL furnished you the uh, the cards, mm-hmm. and uh, I run out of cards a long time ago. Uh, well, you have two different kind of cards. You have the the ones with the uh, uh, for the lousy signals, and then you have Another card, uh, they have a term for it, but these are for exceptionally good signals, where you don't hear any any clicks to chirp, right? Uh, and uh, an outstanding signal, you know, loud, but still not uh, uh, wide, yeah. uh, like you have with with clicks. I got you. Where you have to slow the shape. You have to slow the when you push the key down. There's a slight delay on, on the formation of the letter. It has a, has a rounding, leading edge, and then uh, when you let up on the key, you have to trail it off just uh, in milliseconds. It, you have to look at it with a scope to, to prove it. Right. But you can also recognize it as a good sounding signal, too. I never bother with, it, with a scope. Yeah. You well, I mean, you've been hearing it since 41. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you probably know what it sounds like. I reckon that's a good signal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you have to, on, on a big fat signal, you have to reduce the RF gain control so that you don't pump the AVC in your own receiver. Uh, when, you, when you hit it abruptly, the automatic volume control on the receiver doesn't act quick enough and you get, you get a, a click that really is not there until you get your level down so the receiver doesn't take action to knock it down. It, it has to take a certain amount of time to drop that sensitivity down. Mm-hmm. And uh, while it's doing that, while well, you probably hear a big fat click in, the, in your own receiver, any receiver, if, if it's a fat type. Right. Now, in addition to an OO, you were also a uh, a VE as well, a volunteer examiner. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Still are. You were there when I tested, both times. Yeah, yeah. I'm, but 
they usually have enough examiners they, they just let me sit there you watch the examiners you make sure they don't get out of the way that's <laughs> no <laughs> most of them are bigger than me <laughs> all of them are I'm, I'm at least 125 pounds wet <laughs> <laughs> with his boots full of water yeah yeah, yeah. so um how long ago did you stop climbing? Because it hasn't been that long, has it? Uh, I get up mine once in a while. It, it's, it's, what, 45, 50 feet. Yeah, yeah. But it's got a good ladder. Right. Originally, the ladder was a rickety thing when the government had it. it it's, this came out when they decommissioned the, uh, the towers at, at Spartanburg. I mm -hmm. bid on, on a tower and uh, they practically gave it to me. Wow. Uh, just to get it out of there. Mm -hmm. The uh, the club took those towers down. Is, uh, they say no. They left one tower, but uh, if you have a hundred foot tower, you have to uh, have to have it lit. Mm -hmm. So they, they took the top section off the tower to keep from having to replace light bulbs on the local tower. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think the club took all three of them down. No, there was uh, there was five towers, and uh, yeah, they they took five five. No, they left one. That's right. They left the middle one, and uh, yeah, because the middle one didn't have a light, but if it was the uh, if it was by itself and it was a uh, hundred feet or more, you had to have a light on. So. Uh, they dropped it down to keep having to put a light out on the thing. That's why we left the middle. I got you. But uh, uh, and uh, me and uh, and uh, Gaines, I think Gaines Hall uh, put this thing up. Uh, but uh, they had changed the ladders by that time. The, the criteria for a ladder is you you had to have big boots. And you had to get them, both of them on the same rung, and you had to have a pipe up the middle. So the width of the ladder is at least 12 inches, or maybe 14 inches. And it, it, it's a good ladder. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the original one was just small uh, angle iron and uh, rickety. So I, would, I wasn't comfortable then, and I wouldn't be comfortable going up it now if, that, if that was, that's all I wanted. You've got antennas on your tower, but, but what do you find works best for you for your operating your CW? CW, I use that wire antenna. I hardly ever. The top one is, is uh, the big one is the German antenna, as a matter of fact. Uh, very good antenna. Doesn't have any traps on the thing. Hmm. Nothing to go bad with it as long as, as long as it holds together. So you've got a, is it an 80 meter dipole out here? 80 meter, and it'll work 160 too. I got uh, uh, ladder line mm -hmm. feeding it, and I took out uh, uh, three spacers between every one that, that I leave. In other words, it has a bunch of plastic out there, and the rain gives me a fit, so I took out the spacers. So the wire can be free to move just a little bit, but it's not like having insulation and, and water on that insulation. Right. So it's, uh, it, it'll work 160 meters, just the way it is. What's your favorite band? 80. 80? No, no. On that one, I'm on 40 meters. Okay. That's right. 80 meters is, uh, no, 80 meters is the same antenna. I, I retune the thing. But uh, with the ho I'm thinking of the homebrew now. The homebrew, I use the uh, thing on, on 80 meters. Uh, excuse me. It's 40 meters with the homebrew, mm -hmm. and 80 meters with the uh, with the army. Um, okay. That time. So, um, you, how many nets do you check into a day? Two. Usually twice. Yeah. Twice. Yeah. I get get on uh, 40 meters in the morning. On, uh, 70, 71, 23. And, and, and that's crystal control. And, and, uh, but I can move it around a little bit, mm -hmm. and that control you usually have uh, a parable, and you can tell when they drift a little bit too. 
and I, I stay with them. I, I move the, uh, I got what they call a VXO. You can, you can move a crystal around a little bit. Okay. You move it around about a KC or so. Right. And, uh, and then uh, at night, I, uh, I get on 80 with the same antenna. You ever, did you ever have a time in the hobby that you enjoyed contesting or anything like that? Uh, yeah, there's a contest, the Antique Wireless Association, and that's what this is all about. Okay. And uh, it's not a frantic thing. Uh, you, uh, you call, and in this case, I call CQ and let them come to my frequency. Mm. But they're all in the same boat. They're all uh, using old equipment. Some of them are running some real power, you know. They have a bunch of old tubes. Right. And uh, they don't mind fishing around for a week. Hmm. But that's the only contest I get in. Is, yeah. Is the antique wireless. What is, um, you've been licensed since 46. What's the one of the the most intriguing or, or the event that's happened in amateur radio that's most shocked you or impressed you in, in your time in the hobby? Uh, I don't know. Well, I guess the advent of, uh, of the transceivers having everything in one chunk. Uh, you're automatically on the same frequency unless you take steps to come. In other words, when they say they're listening up five or, right. or up, up Two or three, uh, you can, you can even do that with a transceiver. Right. Uh, is you just switch uh, uh, BFO and the mm -hmm. thing and go to another frequency. Right. So, but that was that was uh, that was quite an event to have everything in one chunk. Instead of having two boxes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That was probably pretty. Pretty was, huge deal. That was uh, one event that, that impressed me, and uh, yeah, I, I use I use the transceiver. Uh, the uh, but the homebrew you have a bunch of knobs to turn if you're going to uh, change frequency and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So then you guys coming into the hobby, I didn't have anyone in my family that was an amateur. I just had all, my dad worked for for Bell, Southern Bell. Okay, I'd always been around electronics in some fashion. Right. I stole his battery to make my CB work when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, I decided to get my license because I finally had done enough of everything else to get my license. But what would you say to someone who is interested? They don't have to be a young person, but uh, interested in getting their license nowadays. I tell them to uh, get a book that explains amateur radio better than we can. Mm -hmm. and, and we furnish a copy of, of the uh, technician class license to the, to the library. And we tell them that, well, if they want to just sit in with, with, with us, that's fine too. Get, it, get exposed to live people. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, the uh, they can they can get this uh, technician uh, book. I've never seen the thing, but it's probably a, uh, a pamphlet, and it gives the uh, uh, exact questions that you're going to be asked. And we tell them, I says, if, if you got a, a memory, that's all that's necessary. If you read now, they have a couple of hundred questions for the for the technician thing. Yeah. And you don't know which one it's going to be asked. But if you've got any kind of retention at all, I, uh, uh, you can pass, pass it, you know. It seems to me I've learned more by having passed the test and doing things in the hobby. I've learned more that way than I ever learned studying to take the test. That's right. It's just the minimum that they give you mm -hmm. uh, of what would be expected. But yeah, you get into it and uh, you get exposed to other people in the same fix, but uh, but 
between between the two of you, why you you pick it up? We like got you're picking up a little bit from me. You know? Yeah, yeah. And that that's the next thing I would lead to is your local club, and how how beneficial that could be to folks new into the hobby. You guys have been great for me on well, so many different levels because the hobby has so many levels. Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, I, I always encourage. I have wondered folks. about that sometimes whether whether uh, uh, your exposure is is worthwhile with the club. You know, mm-hmm. whether we whether we're a good influence or not. Well. <laughs> If you ask my wife about bringing another radio in the house, no, you're a very bad influence. But, but for a new guy that's got a million questions, yeah. I don't think you can beat having local exposure. Well, sometimes you, you don't know uh, how to put a question. If, if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're buffaloed, uh, sometimes you don't know the terms that... that would be familiar right. to, to the other one. Yeah, yeah. But it never hurts to ask. Exactly. Exactly. We all have a pair of ears. All right, so uh, like Fritz said, you know, you got two ears. Everybody can listen, right? So Fritz, thank you again. And thank you, Keith, K4XP, and Gary, k HID, for helping me get that lined up and getting Fritz to sit still long enough to get the interview. All right, uh, thank you again to MTC Radio for sponsoring our giveaway. we got some giveaways from them. Also giveaways from Mary Papa Delta Digital.us, MPDDigital.us. They're a coaxial cable, coaxial cable manufacturer down south of me in Georgia. They do phenomenal work. They've done some work for me on my MCOM boxes, and they just do some beautiful stuff. So we got a gift, uh, a gift package from them as well. As well as me. I bought a couple of wire books from the wire man a few months ago at the Greenwood Ham Fest. So I'm going to give two of those away right now. Let's see. These are randomly generated answers from my MailChimp list. All right. The first winner of wire book number five, Kilo Delta Zero Alpha Echo Lima. KD0AEL. Patty Palmer. Patty, congratulations. I'll get a wire book to you really, really soon. Congratulations again. I've got another wire book five right here, and this one's going to go to Kilo Bravo 1, Yankee Delta Mike, KB1YDM. David Double in New Hampshire. Congratulations, David. Thanks for listening as well. We'll get a wire book five to you really, really soon. Now, here is the mpddigital.us gift pack that they'll they'll get to you. Uh, I'll send them your information. And this one's going to go to Danny Allen, Kilo Mary 5, Victor Kilo. Kilo Mary 5, Victor Kilo. Danny Allen, congratulations. I'll get with you about getting the information over to the mpddigital.us folks. All right, now, the I've got two grand prizes, and these are both from our friends at mtcradio.com. They are $50 gift certificates that you can spend on any uh, telephone purchase. You have to call them so they can get your information, but I'll help you with that. Okay. I, I can help you spend 50 bucks. I'm going to. Okay. All right. Uh, the first one here, MailChimp is Kevin Farr. K E V I N. When I spell Kevin, I don't know it's Kevin. Kevin Farr. F A U R E. Kevin, congratulations. You've won 50 bucks to spend at our dear friends, MTCRadio.com. And hang on, let's get the other one here. Uh, hey, hey, we got our call uh, about the same time. KK4BLG, Kilo Kilo 4, Bravo Lima Golf, William McClinney. I hope I didn't mispronounce that, William. Anyway, KK4BLG, congratulations. You have also won a $50 gift certificate to spend with our friends at mtcradio.com. Okay. Congratulations, everyone. Thanks to everyone, all the sponsors who helped us out to get the stuff together to give to the listeners. Thank you, the listeners, for participating in the show, for reviewing the program on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you're listening to it at. Don't forget, you can always comment. There's a comment tab right there at the top underneath the title of the show, and you can comment there on the website about the program that you've listened to or if you had any questions, I may have missed something through the show. But thank you again for listening. We appreciate you being here. We'll see you the next time, okay? Don't forget, check us out online. It's photime.com. And until next time, guys, God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. 73.
downloading, listening, and subscribing to AmateurRadio15.com presents Bowtime, the other ham radio podcast. You can find our past episodes, web links, and more at AmateurRadio15.com. That's AmateurRadio15.com. Follow us on Twitter at Bowtime Podcast. And remember to visit our show sponsor, Main Trading Company, at mtcradio.com. Till next time, 73s.